The next speaker coming from Los Alamos is Tom Clater. He is probably one of the most distinguished cold fusion experimenters in the United States, at least to me, and I have, have total respect for him. I think people, it's, as I told him this morning, there are certain people in this field that have kept us going for 25 years. He, Mel Miles, George Miley, several others. By anyway, okay, Tom Clayton. Let's go. All right. So, uh, can everybody hear me now? Okay. So, so we're going to talk today about uh, tritium evolution from wires and foils, and uh, this is some new work. Okay. You know, previously from everything that I've done, we went from uh, wires to powder to wires to plasma, and now we're going back to uh, some wires and foils. And uh, those are my collaborators there. So uh, the wires were here. We did these back in uh, 93. We did some powder, uh, tested powder wires. And we switched over to plasma. The problem with the wires that we saw initially, these, these wires here, was that um, they weren't really pure palladium. So we had a total of 20 experiments that we ran with these sorts of one meter wires, 50 microns, and they weren't very reproducible. We had large amounts of tritium in seven experiments from one particular batch. Uh, and then meanwhile, we started these uh, plasma experiments because we thought that uh, palladium alloys or palladium impurities were important uh, and better producers of tritium. So uh, since making these uh, thin palladium alloy wires would be difficult and expensive. We just shelved that process in favor of the plasma technique, and that's what we that's what we've done. Uh, just to recap, some of these uh, wire experiments. These were nominally palladium, pure palladium wires, uh, but they weren't pure. Okay, and I put carbon in parenthesis because we really don't know what that was. It could have been carbon or it could have been uh, molly disulfide or something else. I need to go back and analyze this impurity. But when you uh, heated these wires with pulsed current, uh, what came out were these spots. And they really were really in spots, okay? So they weren't pure and uh, they weren't very uniform. The microstructure of the wire also changed during the experiments. So you had sort of a moving target. You started out with this uh, filamentary structure and then you recrystallize that wire. So as you uh, did the experiment, things would change. Uh, these were uh, difficult uh, experiments because the wire would come off the spoil, it expand, and then it would break at a terminating the experiment. So it was a difficult experiment to do, and so that's why we kind of quit. However, uh, these wires just used 250 milligrams of palladium and we got a fair amount of tritium out of the uh, system, uh, 44 picocuries per hour per gram. And these were fast, short, high-powered pulses. That's what we thought we needed to drive a non-equilibrium situation in that case. Uh, also, some of them were run down in um, a tunnel with Steve Jones, and there we saw some neutrons, and we also brought them back and did the tritium. So the neutron tritium ratio turned out to be three times 10 to the minus eight. So we didn't see any neutrons basically out of these systems. There were a handful of neutrons that you saw in the tunnel. Nothing like 10 to the six uh, that Larry was talking about uh, from these uh, nominally pure palladium. Uh, so then we switched over to plasma cells. So we have these metal foils and alloys. The reason we, we did the plasma was because we could load it. It was a non-equilibrium situation, we're forcing the uh, deuterium in, and uh, it didn't require much material. And we got some spectacular results from four component alloys. So these were very um, complicated alloys, of palladium, rhodium, cobalt, boron. And uh, that's good, but it seems to me that the palladium, that this plasma experiment, you're trying to force the deuterium in and uh, you're heating it at the same time, of course, because this is a 50 kilowatt pulse. Uh, and so it's, it's coming out during the, uh, it's diffusing out. Well, it's kind of a diffusion process, it seems like, 
now because the, the longer pulses tend to uh, uh, seem to produce more heat, more um, tritium. So we've switched over to looking back at these metal foils uh, as we did the palladium wires. We just run a high current through there. Instead of 20 amps, we're running 200 to 500 amps through the nickel and palladium alloys. The nickel has the uh, advantage that you can run it hotter. So this 500 amps through the nickel, it doesn't, doesn't really care. Uh, the palladium, if you ran it uh, that hot, you'd probably dehydrate it. So you have to run it a little cooler. So there's only 48 milligrams of uh, uh, nickel or palladium in there. And we're seeing something like uh, 25 picocuries per gram. Uh, but it's a little bit more reproducible now because we do have a much more sensitive way of looking at the for a tritium. Uh, so we're using longer pulses, higher pressure, and HD mixtures in those in those systems. And that's what one of these uh, foils looks like. So these these are all alloy foils, or there's some pl pure palladium foils as well. Uh, so previously we used these Bolonics. This is the Bolonics graveyard here. Uh, they, typically they're a tube-based uh, system and they burn out after a few years. Now it's all solid state, uh, solid state switch, uh, the energy storage and then the high voltage or the low voltage uh, power supply. So this is a much more compact system than what we had over here uh, when we were doing this at the, the lab. Uh, this is also one of the things that we use for the tritium analysis. It's a inline ion chamber. It has the advantage of being able to see the tritium as you make it. However, it's not as sensitive as a liquid scintillation counter. A liquid scintillation counter, you have to recombine that on a copper oxide bed and then uh, count it. And we typically will count it over a week. But the, uh, but the uh, sensitivity is 10 times. So instead of seeing you know, maybe uh, seven out of 20 experiments uh, have produced something. It's almost 100% now. There's maybe an odd one that uh, broke early uh, and didn't give any tritium. So uh, we're much more sensitive, 10 times more sensitive. So this is the voltage and current waveform from one of those, uh, one of those pulses. We're using a MOSFET pulser. We're just dumping the 68,000 microfarad cap into the foil every two and a half seconds. I'm not going to say that this is optimal because this is what we've done over the last few months. And uh, I think probably we want to go to higher uh, currents, uh, higher current densities, and then much shorter pulses to keep the heating down so we don't melt the wires uh, like, we, uh, like we do. And um, so that's, that's the, uh, the ineffectual current pulse. Okay. Uh, now, some of the samples, this is a nickel alloy here. This is what it looks like uh, prior and post uh, processing. So you can see it does, does melt. And then over here you can see this is the pre-pulsed uh, uh, pre uh, sample. You see the rolling. And you see a faint grain here. After the process, you've uh, expanded those grains. You haven't really enlarged them in the nickel but the grains have uh, popped out. This is with an HD mixture. Um, so uh, we haven't um, annealed them to any degree to where the grains would be larger. Now, this is the really funny next um, slide, which I didn't, I didn't collaborate with anybody on this. This is just one that we have, but this looks like everybody else's piece of palladium. Okay, you have these little rods that come up. It's a qualifier structure down here on this one. So what's the difference between this palladium sample, which started out as this foil, and this palladium sample, which is still kind of a foil but has all of this growth on it? The difference is a slight difference in the pulse, uh, the pulse rise time and current density. And so you'll get a different... Um, and this is the same material. It's a small alloy of mercury and iron was found in this particular palladium sample. Uh, these two are not the same, and this is probably a, a problem with, uh, you know, is it going to be a problem for reproducibility? If you ask me today, 
can I do this again? I'd say, maybe. Uh, and if you ask me, can I do this? I'd say, yeah, I can do that all the time, okay? Which is probably not the, not the one I want. This one uh, was much better in terms of the tritium output than this guy here. But it's, it's kind of remarkable that we've seen these features in uh, every other experiment. So um, someone asked me at the last meeting if there was a neutron, if we look for neutrons during these experiments, we do. The neutrons are, are looked for with a helium-3 detector, not a CR-39 or any other kind of detector. Helium-3 is the gold standard for looking at neutrons. It's sensitive to thermal neutrons, uh, maybe not as sensitive as to uh, two and a half to 14 MeV neutrons, <coughs> but it's, um, it's moderated. Helium-3 tubes are in here and helium-3 is basically black to thermal neutrons, so any fast neutrons that come in will get thermalized and absorbed into there and you'll get a big, a big response. Um, so the detector efficiency that we have is 20%, and then our typical background uh, where we are is uh, about 0.7 counts per second. So if we saw an output of one picocurie per hour, which is what we're seeing, uh, we would be seeing something like 500 times the background if it were hot fusion. So we don't see anything uh, over and above the uh, you know, day, daily variation in the neutron output, which is just due to air pressure and, and temperature variations. This is a uh, counts per time, and you can see that it just kind of wanders up and down. Um, that said, there may be uh, some instances where we do see uh, maybe a sigma or two of uh, neutrons. So I'm just going to give you the, this is all pretty recent work um, on all these batches of wire. Uh, these are wires that um, were nominally pure, okay, different batches. They all have uh, different levels of tritium output. It, these are all run at lower pressures up until here. And these are run at different uh, deuterium concentrations, so 13% deuterium in the hydrogen. Then we started uh, to run the foils, and the foils are all alloys, um, even the palladium foils. Uh, and they're uh, 40 millimeters by 2 millimeters by 50 microns. Those foils tend to breathe, so when you pulse them, they'll contract. Okay, I do the Lorentz uh, forces, and uh, they're, they're also hydrided. And so then after, they, after the pulse comes, they'll re-expand uh, due to the uh, hydriding. So they kind of uh, actually move during the pulsing. Uh, they move quite a bit. And that's what uh, tends to make that uh, wire and then the all, all the cauliflower structure. So these are the uh, foils, these are the rates, these are the last two uh, samples we ran, which were about a pico curie per, uh, per hour. And uh, those are uh, nickel uh, conetic foils, so it's a nickel iron, uh, it's about 17% um, iron. And uh, this palladium uh, mercury iron alloy as well. And uh, so, there's one that, that didn't do anything, and that may have been a short experiment. And then there's a few that have uh, various levels. All of these wires here would have been inert uh, using the other system, so you have to use a liquid scintillation to be able to detect any tritium out of those. Some of these, like this one here, you could see it in the, uh, in the FemProtect system, in the ion system. So, during the period that we're pulsing these wires, uh, we also look with a sodium iodide detector and some other <coughs> detectors. And what we're looking for is we're looking for any signs of uh, radon contamination in the area. Because there is uh, always radon in these buildings that we're, that we're in, and that radon uh, value fluctuates. So uh, what happens is that uh, we just use this as a uh, as an indicator that we're clear of radon. Uh, this is a, an RM80 uh, detector, and what we're seeing here is the temperature is the green line, temperature of the cell, 
That doesn't mean anything other than the fact that we're applying power to the cell. This is the room temperature back here is fluctuating a little bit. We don't have this uh, temperature controlled. And here we're applying um, uh, 50 amps or so to the cell. Here we raise it up to 200 amps peak and then finally it, uh, it fails over here. This is the radiation output for that. It rises starting with that and then decays off. And we typically see this. So what, we're, what we've seen, and this is pretty, um, pretty much uh, similar to what we see from the plasma experiments, except the rise time's a little faster. And then after uh, 10 hours, all the action is over. So the tritium, we feel, is correlated with this. And um, that's, you know, you could run it for another 100 hours, and you might not uh, get much more tritium out of these systems. So, this is all very fast. Could be, uh, you know, as uh, Peter suggested, maybe helium three burning from that. Uh, if you take the um, the uh, signal out here and you take the signal near the peak and you subtract those two spectrally, okay, what you see is this, and this is pretty much what everybody else sees. I think the Russians were the first to see this, but you see a drop and by 250 kilo, kilovolts, there's nothing else out there. So this is a very low frequency, so low energy um, e emissions. What you don't see here is you don't see 600 uh, KEV peak, 638, or any other peak that would indicate radon, okay? If you did, then that would be radon contamination, but we don't see that in this case. So we feel like this is, uh, pretty uh, indicative of the uh, uh, actual reaction, whatever that reaction is. So the next steps would be to put this in a calorimeter <coughs> to uh, run at higher pressures, which we hope to do. Uh, we can't run at higher pressures right now because we still have it hooked up to the, uh, the FEM detect detector, and that is a, uh, that pressure is limited to about 50 PSI. So we'll put that in the calorimeter, we'll run it, we'll see if we see any excess heat. Typically with the plasma cells we're seeing about uh, 250 to 300 milliwatts for this one picocurie per uh, hour output. And uh, my conclusions here are that this nickel alloy is pretty reproducible. We've run a number of those, better than palladium. You saw what palladium did. The nickel actually can be run a lot longer uh, before it uh, degrades. And the tritium can be uh, over several sigma. The effect can be attained in one to two days. So you can run this for a few uh, 20, probably 20 to 30 hours. Then you can uh, re recombine that and then count it. Of course, you want to count that uh, tritium for a week or so to make sure you've got the, uh, the statistics down. And I resisted this for a long time. Um, although we know that you have to have a non-equilibrium situation, but I think this is a diffusion-driven process. Um, and I think, you know, McCubrey and everyone else uh, agrees that there's something going on. So it's diffusion probably across some surface. I don't know whether it's diffusion across the, you know, crack boundaries inside of the material or across the surface. Um, and then if we can uh, increase this uh, X-ray or electron effect, we don't, we're not sure what it is right now, um, but if we can go up higher in current and then get a bigger signal, then uh, that might be a good uh, coffee break demo. So we haven't really, uh, this is pretty new uh, work, we haven't really uh, investigated all this parameter space, um, and I think uh, I need to go back to the literature and look at what everybody else has done in this area, especially you, and see and see where we're where we're at and what we can exploit. So this this driver um, probably indicates that if we do make these multi-layer materials and we do have a number of interfaces, we'll we'll see a bigger effect. So that's all I've got right now. I hope uh, I didn't take too much time before lunch. Thank you.
Yeah. Two questions. Okay, sure. One, uh, which kind of nickel alloy is um, it's a nickel conetic alloy. It's a nickel, nickel, nickel iron, um, manganese, and uh, I think that's it. No copper. Palladium copper did did work in the plasma, but we haven't. You know, we've only done a few uh, alloys here with this. We did 40 alloys in the plasma. Palladium copper was one. Palladium rhodium boron cobalt. Uh, palladium nickel, those were active okay. alloys. Okay, so we haven't done that much with this yet. Um, yeah. Could you expand on this uh, diffusion uh, driven process? What do you mean by that? Okay, so each one of these experiments that we've done has this component of diffusion. You look at the, uh, the powder experiments that we did earlier, okay, we're heating the powder electrically, it's deloading, then it's reloading, this deloading, reloading, we pulse it. The wires, same, same process, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, the powder wire, same, same issues, this, the plasma, the plasma's uh, conflicted because you're trying to load it, okay, with the plasma, but you're also heating it. So you're loading and trying to deload. And then you're turning it off so it, so it deloads. <coughs> So this one, I think, is probably cleaner, a cleaner way to show that it's diffusion-driven, diffusion across some surface. Okay. Yeah, Larry. Did you measure um, the resistivity of that wire as a function of where you thought it was loaded? No, it, okay. it's, it's tough to do. It's tougher than the other wire. The other wire we did, okay. the long wire, yep. this is only 50 milliohms, so it's a little oh. bit and you're running large currents through it, so it's uh, it's like 50, yeah, 50 milliohms one way or the other. So, and that nickel, you know, doesn't load much. So, plus it's changing its shape. Okay, so there you go. all bets are off. All bets are off. Yeah, yeah. Peter has a question. Oh, okay, sure. Um, few questions. What was the sequence of the pulses, and what was the pulse weight? Okay, well, the pulse width, it was uh, just strictly a, a spike. Okay, so the pulse width, if you look at that, it's maybe 10, 5 to 10 milliseconds at that 200 amps, maybe not even that. Okay, because it just goes up and back down. Oh, no, 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 that's, uh, sorry about that. It's every um, two and a half seconds to 10 seconds. So you have to let the palladium breathe, so you want to, let the uh, diffusion go in, so that's a 10 second process. And what happened when you applied the calorimetry we, around the... We, we, we haven't done that yet. Oh. That's, that's that last slide. That's the calorimeter that it'll go into. Okay. I, you know, I don't expect to see much, but... And what was the maximum pressure that you... Uh, it was one atmosphere, it was 760 torr. Okay. That's the big driver I think we're going to be able to uh, manipulate that in the current. Sure, Peter. So nickel has terrible solubility for hydrogen and deuterium. Can you give me gas in your nickel? Right. So that nickel, when, it, uh, when it's being pulsed at 500 amps, it's glowing. Okay. So, 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 that so it's at 600 degrees. Oh, yeah, yeah. Solubility is... Uh, uh, pressure actually goes up, you know, during the pulse. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you something later about desorption, but uh, we haven't done any of that here yet on the on the wires. No. We, we have the possibility if it's convenient. So, so on the fuzzy wire, the wire with the cauliflower, the uh, efflorescence coming off, that one, if you just take it out, it 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 desorbs instantly. But uh, 
you know, measuring that is another matter. And so, you know, we may have to heat it up to get that particular. The, the uh, Foucault's thermal desorption peaks that were uh -huh. uh, signified vacancy during <laughs> something like uh, 640 C to 800 C or something. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we've had our eye on the uh, that um, uh, vacancy uh, for a while, but we haven't. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's something we should do. Yeah. Any other questions? Everybody ready for lunch? Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.